Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for joining this uh, third and last of uh, our, our webinar series on, uh, on with, in partnership with the Food Tech Challenge. Uh, Max here, CEO and co-founder of Forward Fooding. Uh, let me tell you a bit about, about the, the agenda of the evening, first of all. So first off, I'm going to give a very brief introduction about, about Forward Fooding, uh, and then I'll pass it over to Eitu from the Food Tech Challenge team, who's going to tell you more about, uh, about, about the competition. Uh, and then we're going to have a panel of very uh, exciting speakers to uh, to join us tonight. So um, very briefly, a forward footing for the ones who don't know uh, what we do. Uh, we are the world's first collaborative platform for the food and drinks industry and for agri-food tech in particular. Uh, our mission uh, is to enable connections between the key stakeholders of the ecosystem, from startups to corporates, investors, accelerators, uh, and other relevant stakeholders with the idea of generating connections and enabling collaboration to scale innovation. That's our main mission. Um, I, how we do it, concretely speaking, uh, mostly around three main categories. The first one uh, is about scouting and consulting for corporate clients of the food industry and investors. Uh, what we do is working with the open innovation and R&D teams of the likes of Cargill, General Mills, Nestle, Danone, and a few others helping them understanding the agri-food tech sector via uh, research work, uh, workshops, reports, and other um, services that we can deliver, uh, and then scout companies that they can engage with. We also work with investors doing due diligence and uh, in consulting work as well. Uh, the second part of our business is around data. We have developed the Food Tech Data Navigator platform, which is a database of agri-food tech startups globally, and is also mapping out all the other key players and stakeholders in the sector from investors to uh, corporate organizations investing in the space uh, and other other accelerators and ecosystem enablers. This platform provides us with uh, data and live analytics about how the agri-food tech sector is evolving. This is the source that we use for our consulting work, but also our clients have uh, access to this platform via our monthly subscription. And then the last bit of what we do is all about community building uh, and give, giving visibility uh, to, the, to startups and to the sector in general and raising awareness about the challenges that our food system is facing. The main angle uh, with it and the main approach that we take is about the Food Tech 500, which is this uh, global startup competition that we have been running for the past uh, three years now. Uh, that has been generating more than 5,000 applications from startups around the world uh, in the past three years and now becoming uh, a benchmark for the industry. Uh, and we also have food innovation hubs uh, in London, Barcelona, and uh, Milan since recently where we support startups that we incubate in the space by uh, providing support and enabling connections uh, within the ecosystem. And where we also regularly re organize uh, regular live events to uh, basically create synergies again uh, across the sector. Um, over the years, uh, we've been working with uh, more than 30 corporate clients, uh, have more than 7,000 companies in our, in our database, uh, as far as agri-food tech startups are concerned. Uh, we have more than 20 companies that are resident uh, within our hubs uh, and generating more than 5,000 applications uh, of the food tech 500, as mentioned. Uh, and here are a few of our clients and also other uh, partners that we have been working with um, over the years. So without further ado, uh, if you have any questions, of course, about forward feeding, you can visit our website or um, or just email us at uh, info at forwardfooding.com. So I'm passing over now to a to talk about the Food Tech Challenge. a you here. Hello, hello. a said he can't unmute himself. So if you can do that for him. Yeah, yeah. Just, just work now. I'm unmuted now. All good? Yeah, you can hear me? Yes. Perfect. Okay. Lovely to see you as well. Yes, of course. Thank you so much, Max, and uh, hello, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, as Max mentioned, my name is Aitun Shkuler, and I'm a part of the Food Tech Challenge team at Temkin. I'm leading on outreach and partnerships. And for the next 10 minutes, I'll take you through the Food Tech Challenge and provide some information about the competition, the prize, and share some key how-tos. And if you have any questions, please feel free to put them in the chat and we'll do our best to reply to them after the presentation. Next slide. So the Food Tech Challenge is a global competition with a prize pool of $2 million. And we're seeking the next wave of innovations that can transform food and act practices efficiently and sustainably. 
We as Temkin co-delivered the challenge with our two main partners, the UAE Ministry of Climate Change and Environment and Aspire, which is Abu Dhabi's technology wayfinder. Next slide. So food tech challenges focused on increasing food production and reducing food loss and waste. On food production, the reasons why the UAE might be interested in sparking innovation in this area might be obvious, but you'll see them on the left-hand side. Uh, things like limited arable land, freshwater scarcity, and of course, a very hot climate. And at the same time, the UAE uh, has a very clear and visionary target. As outlined in the National Food Security Strategy, as you'll see, uh, we have a specific target around increasing the yield through technology by 30% and increasing the production of strategic food items by 15%. Our second pillar is another critical area for the UAE, and in some ways, as a function of the UAE's high standards of living and level of economic development, it means there is an opportunity to reduce the quite high per capita levels of waste. And here too, we have a very clear and visionary target to reduce the level of food loss and waste in the country by 50% in the next less than a decade. In terms of eligibility, uh, Food Tech Challenge is a global competition and will accept early stage startup submissions globally. Uh, and when we say early stage, we mean startups that have a workable minimum viable product that they can demonstrate as part of the competition and also to various investors, partners and stakeholders in the UAE. We're also looking for startups that haven't yet gone through Series A funding or the roughly equivalent level in whatever their home country is. Uh, those that have been in operation for less than five years with no more than 25 employees. If you have any questions about these very uh, specific eligibility criteria, our email address is info at foodtechchallenge.com that you'll see at the bottom. And uh, please email us and we'll be more than happy to understand your situation and give you some steer as to whether your idea is eligible or not. So as the Food Tech Challenge, we're very proud to be supported by key stakeholders in the UAE, from sector experts to innovation accelerators. Uh, these partnerships are critical for our impact and success. We're committed to mobilizing the full UE ecosystem in order to ensure all of the winners, finalists, and even participants that come through our competition have access to the information and support that they need to have a soft landing in the UE. Our track partners, uh, ADQ and Silal for food production and Emirates Foundation and the Crown Prince Court for food loss and waste. And our enablement partners is a growing list that currently include Catalyst, which is offering its acceleration support, uh, ADGM is an international financial center offering registration support for startups. Khalifa Fund is an advisory platform for entrepreneurs uh, who will be conducting mentorship programs for our uh, finalists. And the Abu Dhabi Residence Office, which supports the thriving international community in the UAE with golden visas and various other support schemes. In terms of uh, the prize, it's fundamentally designed to set up uh, promising startups for success in the UAE. So we're focused on the particular challenges that we face here. Uh, so we want to incubate solutions in the UAE that can then scale and expand to other parts of the world. However, it is important to say that UAE impact and strategic priorities are also very global and do have a wide reaching application all around the world. In terms of why the UAE is a launchpad for growing and scaling your ideas, there are a number of unique factors that actually make the UAE very well positioned in this area. Uh, the UAE has a target to be the number one most food secure nation in the world by 2051. And more fundamentally, uh, innovation is really vital in the UAE and it's deeply embedded in its DNA. It is supported by great infrastructure and of course, uh, a strategic location at the crossroads of the world. Next slide, thank you. Um, so some more details on the prize pool. We plan to award four winners who will split a total prize of $2 million. The cash portion of the prize is $400,000, which will be paid in two installments, as you see on the left-hand side. And the remaining core element of the prize is $1.6 million in cash and in other in-kind support. And by in-kind support, we mean things like cash grants to support innovation and R&D, a startup acceleration support, including access to labs, manufacturing facilities, incorporation support, as I mentioned earlier, visa support, and mentorship opportunities with UAE subject matter experts. The process uh, by which we award the winners is here, along with the list of our judges. Uh, participants will go through a basic screening process to determine the completeness of their submissions and eligibility in the beginning. Then there will be a technical and commercial evaluation of the business case and demo videos. And then the shortlisted applicants are interviewed by our partners, either in person here in the UAE or virtually, uh, in order to select the top 20 submissions. And then finally, our finale judges uh, select the four winners. 
in terms of how to's um, here, you'll see the timeline for the food tech challenge. The two key deadlines at the moment are May 20 and June 24. Uh, the first one is the early submission deadline, and the second one is the regular submission deadline. And I'll explain what those mean in the next slide. And uh, we expect to, we expect to award, to award the winners in uh, November of this year, so in the next uh, about six months or so. So the applicants in Food Tech Challenge have two options or pathways through which they can apply. We're calling option one early submission, and this is recommended if you're unsure of your eligibility or would like to get feedback on your submissions. Uh, in this option, you will submit the application form and a short overview of your proposal that we're calling executive summary. Then the FTC evaluators will determine your eligibility and you'll be notified in early June. You can also receive feedback on your application form if it's relevant. And in this case, you will have until June 24 to reflect any changes and submit your supporting information like the business case and demo video. The second option is called regular submission. And this is more suitable for startups that have all the information required and they're familiar with the food and agriculture sectors in the UAE or are sure about their eligibility for the challenge. The deadline for this is also June 24, and you'll be asked to submit the full application form and all your supporting information, including a detailed business case and a demo video. If you choose the regular submission option, though, uh, I have to say you will not be able to receive feedback from the Food Tech Challenge Evaluator, so it is uh, your call. And I should note that, obviously, all the applications have to be completed in English. Applying to Food Tech Challenge uh, is a fairly straightforward and simple process. You'll need to visit our website, www.foodtechchallenge.com. Um, there you'll see an apply button located in the top right corner. Uh, this will let you access the application portal through which you can fill in your details, and register your account and submit your application within the same portal. I just want to point out that you can access and complete your application at any time before June 24. So you can start your application today, save it and submit it at a later date before June 24. And finally, uh, please do feel free to engage with us on our website, our social media channels, which you'll see there uh, at Food Tech UAE and uh, subscribe to our monthly newsletter. It's, it's a great piece of collateral that we put out every month. Uh, we hope that you'll consider applying if this sounds like it would be of interest to you. If not, please feel free to spread the word in your networks with your colleagues about the Food Tech Challenge and encourage them to apply as well. Uh, we're really looking forward to engaging with all of you. So um, thank you for being on the call today. And with that, I'd like to pass the mic back over to you. Thank you, Max. Thank you, Ai Chung. And uh, without further ado, and I'm passing to, to Han to introduce herself and in introduce the speakers for tonight. And you're muted, sorry. Sorry, can you see me though? Yes. Okay, my apologies. So uh, I was just saying good morning and good afternoon, everyone. My name is Anne Lemore. I'm uh, an advisor at Forward Fooding. Uh, I'm also a United Nations Food Systems Champion and uh, the co-founder and president of Chef for the Planet, which is an international community of chefs promoting uh, sustainable gastronomy. I'm really delighted uh, to be with you all uh, today um, for our third webinar uh, dedicated to food tech and uh, act tech with a specific focus on the UAE and the Middle East uh, region. Uh, we discussed um, in the course of our previous seminars um, farming 2.0 and alternative proteins and today uh, we will talk about uh, food waste. Um, and their contribution to making uh, the value chain uh, much more sustainable and efficient. Um, Aitun mentioned, I think, when presenting the food tech challenges just now, why it was so important for the region to focus, the, the UAE and the Middle East, to focus on food security, to focus on uh, reducing food loss and, and waste. Uh, and before we dive into the solutions and innovation with our five speakers, uh, which uh, I will introduce uh, then, I wanted to make three uh, general points. The first one, um, and zooming out of the Middle East to the global level, you may have seen the latest um, United Nations IPCC report uh, on climate called um, Climate Change 2022, Impacts, Adaptation and Vulnerability. Uh, it was published some weeks ago 
And the report states in no uncertain terms, i.e. in scientific language, um, and I'm quoting with high conf confidence, and I'm quoting again, that climate change will increasingly put pressure on food production and access, especially in vulnerable regions, undermining food security and nutrition. And if we add to climate change, you know, all other global phenomena such as um, population growth, pandemics and wars, uh, we know that we will be faced in a very foreseeable future with very serious issues of disruption of uh, food supply chain production, food security uh, and famine uh, on a fairly la large scale. The second point I wanted to make is that not only is global warming putting pressure on food production and access, but our current agricultural and food systems are also massively contributing to climate change, uh, to biodiversity loss, and also to uh, the depletion of our natural resources, notably uh, water. This is something that we look um, into very much uh, within the UN and, and when there was a UN food systems uh, summit last year. Uh, just to mention two facts, um, and most of you will be very familiar, but at the global level, uh, our current food and agricultural practices are contributing to about one third of our emissions and to about 70% um, of our usage of fresh water, uh, notably to feed animals. So clearly our current uh, agriculture and food systems is not sustainable and we need to uh, transform it at the systemic level and there are many different ways to do it and reducing uh, food waste is, is one of them and the final point um, I wanted to make and I want to zoom back uh, to the Middle East um, is that um, the issue of food security and the food waste is particularly relevant uh, to that region uh, as mentioned before because also um, the Gulf countries import between 80 to 90% of their food consumption. And if, if we think about different options and different avenues to, to meet food security challenges in, in the region, um, we have uh, several, I mean, there are several options. One clearly is to beef up investments in overseas uh, production assets. Uh, we can also, um, the go governments can also invest in secure sources of supply. Uh, we can look into how to increase local production through tech and innovation, notably, and that was uh, the focus of our previous webinars. But the four, fourth point is really that we need to reduce uh, food waste. According to the FAO, about one third of the food uh, is wasted in the region. Um, and according to the UAE Ministry of Climate Change and Environment, this food wastage, food wastage is costing the UAE 3.5 billion uh, US dollars per year. So food waste is costly for business, it's costly for the environment, for our climate. And um, now I would like uh, to pass on the floor to our speakers. Um, the, in, the, the webinar is meant to be um, as interactive as possible. So please, um, all of you, if you have any questions for our speakers, do not hesitate to put the questions in the chat um, and uh, we will uh, channel uh, the questions uh, to them. Uh, so perhaps to start, uh, Ricardos, you're um, calling from uh, Lebanon. Uh, welcome. I, you. Could you perhaps introduce your company? You're the founder and CTO of Starchy. Um, could you introduce your company and your journey and, and how it is contributing to, to the issue of food waste? Yeah, sure. So the whole story of Starchy uh, began back in 2017 when we had a crisis in Lebanon uh, concerning uh, fruits and vegetables, and uh, specific, uh, specifically apples, the apple sector. The growers were throwing their apples on ground because they couldn't afford the cold storage price. And they, they, there was different challenges and competition in this sector as well. So um, I was uh, in the lab and as being a scientist, uh, a lot of people 
told me that you should scientists do something for this and you should work on maybe a solution to extend the shelf life of fruits outside of cold storage and uh, help us to increase to maintain the quality uh, in retail and during during uh, transportation and those kind of uh, things. So um, after I did a lot of work in the lab with my uh, partners and founders right now, we ended up with a solution that is uh, a liquid that, that is 100% natural. And this liquid, once we you sprayed it on fruits uh, and vegetable as a replacement to what is right now in the industry used uh, like other coatings and wax, uh, um, it creates a layer that is transparent, odorless, and it's, an ed it's a fully edible layer and it's also washable. This layer uh, decreases the oxidation of the fruit by decreasing the respiration rate. So after we developed the minimum viable product, we've, uh, We've registered the company in the US. Uh, and one of my US friends joined as partner. And from there, we took the company to the next level where we, uh, we got uh, the organic certification for the, the, the product. And we ended up being the first, uh, the first company to sell uh, for organic apples in the US, working with major retailers, major exporters and growers of apples. Uh, so now we are uh, an R&D uh, oriented company uh, that produces the liquid we have, which is the first product for apples called the umbrella. Um, so we produce this product in Germany with Duller Group, uh, one of the tops top uh, producer of uh, food ingredients and beverage in, in Germany. And also we produce in the US. Uh, we do the, we still are doing the research and development for other fruits and vegetables in Lebanon. Uh, so the team is split between the MENA region and uh, globally. Um, and right now we are scaling uh, all over the world uh, to Europe, to Africa, and also to the MENA region. We began also some uh, exciting uh, activities in Lebanon, where uh, we st we're starting right now to help avocado growers to test uh, on our product and uh, use this product to extend the shelf life of the avocados during transportation from Lebanon to different chains like Russia, like uh, like Netherlands and uh, uh, other uh, other parts of the world. So the mission we have is. Um, with a really cost, costly product uh, that doesn't really uh, affect the chain in a way because it's a, it's a drop in replacement to an to a, to a industry that exists already, which is wax. First, it's a product that protects the fruit or the vegetable from farm to fork. Uh, we, we, we see that the, the product is uh, is doing a great job on reducing the food waste since we see reducing decay in cold storage and uh, outside cold storage on shelves during transportation we have, we are maintaining uh, an amazing quality from farm to the fork of the customer where a lot of good feedbacks we are having from major top retailers uh, like whole food in the US which is top uh, organic food. So um, we we are willing to transfer this technology uh, to the whole world. And uh, this is the mission, basically. The, the basically, uh, the mission is to apply this technology on as much as we can fruits and vegetables in order to reduce the waste uh, through the whole chain. Thank you so much, uh, Ricardo. Um, I would now like to pass on the floor to Burak uh, Karapinar. I think Burak, you're in Dubai uh, today and you're the founder and managing director of QS Monitor. Um, could you tell us a bit more about your company and how it's contributing to um, uh, reducing food waste? 
and your journey, uh, your, your journey maybe. Thank you, thank you. And uh, I, I believe it's a great platform. I'd like to thank Max and, and the team as well uh, for uh, letting me join to this uh, great audience. Uh, as you mentioned, Chris Monitor uh, is based out of UAE. Uh, we have two offices here in Abu Dhabi and Dubai. Uh, and we are focusing on how to, to reduce the food waste uh, through the supply chain uh, due to either contamination, irregularities, or non-compliance uh, between the different countries, uh, trade between the different countries internationally. But uh, when you started uh, your introduction, you mentioned that you know this, this region uh, as a whole uh, is dependent on the import of food. Uh, in some, some cases, it goes up to 95% of the food is imported in some of these countries. And they are dependent heavily on uh, suppliers outside of uh, GCC region. And this brings a whole lot of different types of risks uh, to the food ecosystem uh, within the UAE. Uh, and uh, since food is not a consistent uh, material uh, from a chemist, uh, chemistry perspective, it needs to be monitored, it needs to be tracked to see where these risks are coming from. Uh, so that eventually, uh, when it comes to uh, the plate of the consumer, there is no health risks, there is no contamination risks, or there's no outbreaks uh, due to this. Uh, so governments have certain controls and uh, stakeholders uh, within the food ecosystem have certain controls, but this is not enough. And in some cases, we see that uh, up to 40% of the food that's being imported or traded uh, can be non-compliant, can be dangerous uh, to consume. And uh, we are trying to find out where this is coming from, and then we are trying to uh, fix this problem uh, with the help of the government authorities, private sector producers, uh, and the other stakeholders uh, in the ecosystem. Uh, and we have also realized that having access to new markets is a, is a challenge for the suppliers, as well as for the uh, importers to access to new suppliers and uh, meeting the requirement of their own market is, is, a, is a challenge. So we're trying to address that. We're trying to make their life easier and make it accessible for them to go into the new markets. Uh, with this, we are using different uh, technologies. We integrate IoT devices for tracking these uh, supply chain and see where the risks are coming from and how we can eliminate those so we can reduce the food waste. Second is we're trying to analyze the data that we capture at different parts of this critical control points so that we see where it's coming from, whether it could be at the farm, it could be at the factories, warehouses, or during transportation and logistic or storage, so that uh, when it comes to uh, the consumer, uh, there's no risk there uh, from that perspective. Thank you so much, Barak. Um, I'm now going to move from Dubai to Europe, to the Netherlands, um, and uh, David, uh, welcome. Uh, you're currently in the Netherlands and you're the senior VP um, business developments of Wasteless, which is an uh, Israeli Dutch venture, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, can you tell us a bit more about Wasteless? Yeah, thanks uh, very much, Anne, and uh, great uh, to, be, uh, to be here with the uh, uh, audience all over the world. I'm actually at Wageningen University at the moment, which is uh, the prime agricultural university uh, in the world. Wastes does something very simple, and um, actually, it's not. In, we're not in food waste. We're actually in profitability, because the fact is that preventing food waste is one of the most uh, impactful, scalable, but also profitable solutions to the climate crisis. Now, what does Wastes do? We uh, optim we find the optimal price point for food in supermarkets which means that if you go to your, uh, you know, after the seminar and you're, uh, you're hungry, you don't feel like cooking, you go to your, uh, to your uh, local Carrefour by uh, Majid al Futim, and uh, you want to pick up a ready-made meal. So today is the 12th of May and you find a ready-made meal, say uh, a nice uh, pasta salad with an expiration date of May 15. But you should also see one of May 18, which one are you going to pick? So mostly people pick the 18th May, because uh, it has a higher perceived freshness, but the same price. Wasteless gives you the incentive to buy products with a shorter expiration date, uh, and the incentive is a price incentive. So you save some euros, 
some dollars, some uh, some uh, real, uh, and you buy perfectly fresh food. Why is this so interesting? Because retailers can become a lot more profitable. You can they can increase say 25% of their sales, 10% of their margins on these uh, on these products, and that's really really important. It's important because the cost price, the cost of food waste to the global uh, system, to our planet, is bigger than the actual turnover of the food system. So food waste is costing us, it's costing us uh, money that you as a consumer pay, it's costing profits to the supermarkets, it's costing the planet, it's actually eating up the future of our children. So there's no time to waste. And uh, I really look forward to the, uh, to the discussion with, uh, with all the other experts. Thanks very much. Thank you, David. Um, I would now like to go to Cairo. Um, Abdul Rahman, you're the co-founder and uh, managing partner at Cup Mina. Um, you're working with Ground Coffee. Can you tell us uh, what Cup Mina is all about? and how you, you came about to uh, launch this solution, uh, especially in Egypt. I think you're on mute, Abdul Rahman. You need to unmute your mic. Maybe you cannot do it. I can't unmute. I don't know if Max. Ah. I can, you can hear me now, that's right. We but can. Thanks for Welcome. Thanks for the introduction, Annie. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be with you today. Uh, about Carmena, you, as you know, uh, coffee is the most consumed beverage in the world. We drink coffee every day, and that's make it one of the biggest way that we produce in the world. By drinking 2.2 billion cups of coffee every day, that reduces over 16 million tons of coffee ground around the year. And a, a lot of amount of coffee ground not being used. And that's actually one of the motives that to be uh, co-founding Carmena be able to maximize the value out of this coffee ground and recycle it again to try to, to save the environment and try to help the ecosystem or the agriculture ecosystem specifically to go and produce uh, natural products. When we started with Carbmena, our, our first goal that how we can recycle the coffee ground and eliminate the, the waste and the damage for the environment. And actually, this is one of the major things that we, we, we mainly focus on. After we found that the way that we can create a, a real value chain to be able to collect the spent coffee ground from the coffee shops, we start partnering with Costa and Dunkin' Donut and many other local uh, coffee chains existing in Cairo, moving for uh, companies and offices collecting their spent coffee ground. We start looking what we can do with spent coffee ground. So going for the, 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 the food system or the ecosystem for the food or agriculture, we found there main problem regarding to this. But one of the things that we found that we really can focus on and can get it into, it's mushroom. So we start doing our research of how we can grow mushroom on coffee ground. And actually this was one of was one, our first product to be able to produce. We are using spent coffee ground to grow different types of oyster mushroom for the local markets. And for uh, soon enough, we will be exporting our mushroom outside Egypt for the mini region. Actually, this is one of the first uh, products that we start focus on. And we found there is a good opportunity and actually a great opportunity to go and, and keep expanding on it. Uh, after that, we found there is many other products or other uh, chains in the agriculture system that we can expand in. Currently, we are working to develop uh, fertilizers from spent coffee ground and animal feeds to help the other sectors in the agriculture sector because that we can recycle the spent coffee ground and reduce more products that support the, the agriculture system in Cairo and the mineral region and in the world also. That's in a nutshell what you're doing. Thank you very much. Uh, and now to our, our last speaker, Oljay. Um, good evening. Good evening. Um, you're in Marrakesh today um, and you're the CEO and co-founder of Fazla Gida. I don't know if I'm pronouncing well, which is a, a Turkish company. Yes. Um, we look forward to hearing about it. So Fazla Gida in direct translation, first of all, is it means surplus food. So what we do, um, Fazla Gida is a digital based platform that is connecting the food surplus owners with the uh, parties that can receive it. Um, so we apply the food recovery hierarchy principles into the ecosystem and the digital uh, platform that we manage. 
Um, so companies like retailers, distributors, producers, or any kind of company who has a food surplus can use the platform to connect it with NGOs to donate, um, B2B buyers uh, for liquidation sales, and also uh, selling their surplus for animal feed as a raw material in the industry, and finally sending it to the biogas and other recycling solutions. So we provide then end-to-end -end traceability and reporting lines and data analytics uh, to help companies, first of all, manage their surplus in the best way according to the food recovery hierarchy. So we aim to reduce food, uh, food waste related carbon emission by 50%. And later on, uh, benefiting from the analytics and the reporting lines, so they can decrease the waste in the source by uh, taking actions after learning about the trends and what's happening uh, in their uh, food surplus in their warehouses or stores, etc. So this is what we do basically. Um, so when we look at the overall percentages, maybe I can just say around five to ten percent of the surplus we manage we donate, around 60% we sell it as a liquidation and 35% goes to other parts. Um, so yeah, this is the basically what we are doing. And so far we have managed uh, around in five years, 35,000 tons of food in Turkey. Um, so trying to uh, increase the scale. Thank you, LJ. Um, I, I saw at some point that some hands uh, were up from participants. Um, if you could please channel your questions for the speakers through the, the chat function, uh, and we will do our best to, to ask. Uh, perhaps, you know, uh, after those introductions, it's uh, clear that uh, food is really being wasted um, throughout uh, the food supply chains, you know, wh whether it's at farm level, on the other hand, in restaurants, at home, in supermarkets. Um, in your experience, um, and especially if we focus on, on the Middle East, what would you say, I mean, what is your company, which part of the supply, food supply um, change your company is trying to, to tackle more specifically? And what do you think, um, and what is in your experience has been the main challenge? And I don't know if there is anyone who would like to, to start. Maybe David. Yeah, sure. <clears throat> Thanks. Um, so, um, so we are uh, not active yet in the in the Gulf, but we're in active uh, discussions. Uh, and one of the uh, one of the obstacles uh, at first was that uh, there was the, the the clear link between profitability of a supermarket and food waste uh, wasn't uh, wasn't there in the first instance. So then we uh, we cooperated with a with a very large uh, a chain. We uh, investigated their data, and it became very clear that uh, that there is a strong business case. Because obviously, uh, when we're talking about food waste prevention, it's not just an environmental issue. It's not just a, uh, a health uh, and a, and a, a issue or or climate issue. It has to be a business case. So the first uh, thing that you always have to do is to sit with your customer and to understand the customers of your customer. So in this case, uh, is in this case consumers, and uh, and we're really there. I'm I'm expecting to go live in uh, in the Gulf uh, in the next couple of months, uh, and that's and that's and that's really exciting because, uh, like you said, uh, all the food uh, there's so much food imported that actually making more use of the food that is already on the shelf. That is, uh, it's where the where the mess for opportunity lies. Thank you, David. Burak? Uh, yeah, I, I'd like to contribute on this. I mean, uh, here uh, the, the challenge is the demographics. I would say initially, uh, because when you look at the GCC region, uh, you will see uh, all sorts of expats or. Uh, people coming from all over the world and they have their own expectations, they have their own uh, consumption habits and this creates uh, all sorts of uh, challenges for the authorities here and the private sector as well uh, when it comes from the sourcing, when it comes from risk uh, management perspective. Uh, so identifying all these risks, having the access to all this data, market data uh, was the biggest challenge for us. Uh, I, I worked a lot in the passed with the uh, Europe, uh, EU countries, and it was uh, much, much easier compared to here. I mean, there are 
shared databases, shared information. There are practices that are being implemented for many years uh, for uh, food safety uh, in the EU zone. And uh, the suppliers are uh, familiar with all these applications. Uh, but when you bring a similar approach to GCC countries, it's, it's a whole set of different rules for the suppliers. And uh, most cases, they don't understand, they don't comply, or it takes time for them to comply with these rules and regulations. And, and then they have to do a significant investment. So uh, it, it is a main challenge for us. And uh, aligning the expectation and interests of the whole ecosystem, be it suppliers, be it the buyers or the government, uh, is, is not an easy task. Uh, so we started from scratch, and we are trying to find out uh, common ground for all these people so that it's, it's much easier to access this information and uh, access to both sides uh, of the uh, equation, I should say. Thank you, Ricardos. And, and just to mention, I think, um, Zach, uh, you will not be able to, to, to speak, if, but if you have a question, please uh, uh, give it to us through the chat function. Thank you. Uh, Ricardos, the floor is yours. Yeah, so uh, actually when we talk about the food waste uh, in the MENA region, we have to take into consideration the different phases of uh, the food chain. So um, as you know, there is the production phase, there is the distribution, there is the retails, there's the consumer phase. And there is a difference in the way the countries in the MENA and Gulf region are um, doing the waste management. Uh, and maybe uh, hunting the solutions for it. So in countries like Lebanon, Syria, Jordan, uh, Iraq, those countries, the way uh, the, uh, the public sector is acting towards those, uh, those activities, especially for waste management and uh, food security is way different than uh, how the Gulf region is acting towards it by hunting for more solution and having the resources which is capital and also uh, expertise to uh, develop uh, the, this part of, uh, of the sector. And our, with our startup, we've tried to help the, the waste management of uh, the post-harvest part of the, of, the, of the food chain, specifically for uh, fresh produce. Because in this part, you have the handling of the fruit, the packaging, you have uh, the treatment of the fruits, you have the cold chain, you have the distribution, you have the retails, uh, the marketing of fruits and vegetables, and also the behavior of the consumer, which you cannot predict. Uh, and in some cases, you need to educate the consumer in order to have a better waste management uh, effect. So I think the way uh, we should look into waste management uh, and reducing the waste, which is reducing the hunger later on, is, uh, is a whole strategy for the whole chain uh, relating between public sector and private sector, uh, which is, will help use the right capital for the, height, for the right hunting for solutions. Thank you. Um, I don't know if uh, Olje or Abu Haman, you know, from Turkey or Egypt, do you have the same experience about the, the challenges of, of having multiple actors uh, and, and all the different value chains points which need to be influenced? So I, I can just jump in for Turkey, also for MENA maybe just shortly. So we are also not active in MENA region yet. I mean, not the Gulf region. Um, so the Ricardo's comments are really good because in the value chain and supply chain, there are different needs uh, at every stage of the food and redistribution channels, et cetera. And there should be different um, partners in the ecosystem to be able to uh, manage it in the right way. It's not easy. It's not just one party to one party. So recyclers are a different thing. Uh, resellers are a different thing and the NGOs are different. So. In our case, in Turkey, we used uh, the country as the learning model to combine all these parties and manage in one uh, flow. Uh, so there are some similarities in the flows of managing the surplus, but also differentiations. So in, in, we tried to simplify the processes. Um, however, um, it also requires uh, focus on according to situations of the countries. 
So like Turkey, um, all inclusive hotels are really important. So then we need to focus on hotels. Uh, we have the food production and agriculture that we need to focus on that. In every value chain, uh, Turkey is very uh, active and the, the food, food waste is big. Uh, but when it comes to MENA and Gulf region, uh, upon our visits, uh, for instance, we see that we need to focus more on the imported foods in that region uh, as well, uh, unlike other countries. So more focus maybe on imports and also the uh, distributor and wholesale channel. Um, there, there we see a gap. Uh, this is one thing. And also considering the scarcity in the production, as just Ricardo mentioned, in the after uh, post-harvest is really uh, important. So when we look at any country as a potential for waste management and food waste management, then we need to analyze the situation where they position themselves in the value chain and food production. So this is what I can uh, add from our perspective. Also in Egypt, it's, it's not quite different from other countries like in the region. It's quite similar to this, uh, but in each, each part of the value chain, the food waste has a different interaction or a different approach for the waste itself. So it's different from uh, from sector to sector or from the, the, the part of the part, how they interact with the waste itself, the recycling the process, uh, how they, 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 they do, do, do this uh, kind of waste and uh, the, the money for this. Recently, we started and founding many, many uh, initiatives to be able to have uh, impact for this kind of waste to be able to recycle it or minimizing this kind of waste. But it's not having the, for the, the, the level that we can, that we are minimizing the food waste and we have a real interaction or real uh, uh, sourcing for this kind of waste or this uh, sign kind of things. Thank you. Ricardos, you want to add anything? Uh, your, hand is, your hand is up. No, it's, it's freezed. Uh, ah, okay. I don't okay. know why. No, so thank you. Maybe like uh, moving on from, um, you know, the, the food supply chain and how it's affecting so many different entry points. I was wondering whether in, in your business, um, what has been the impact of uh, the pandemic? I've, have, has it has, and, and maybe now the, uh, the war in, in Europe, uh, do you see a change in each of you in your different um, environments? Uh, a change in attitude uh, towards uh, the issues that you're tackling, uh, maybe more interest or uh, more challenges? Um, let me start on this uh, because we have uh, just launched our operation right before the pandemic and our assumptions during the pandemic totally changed. Um, as you know, the supply chain uh, of the whole uh, products, not only the food, but all of the consumer products all over the world was set uh, for many years, decades uh, in a certain way. But after the pandemic, what happened was uh, there was lots of disruptions. Uh, you know, uh, the, the ships were empty. They were uh, either landlocked or gridlocked in certain ports. They, they were not moving. They didn't go to main destinations. So the uh, regional hubs were not uh, working in a sense. So this created a significant uh, supply chain disruption to the whole system uh, and certain countries became more and more uh, concerned about their food supply so they, they banned exports of food uh, which was not something that we used to you know it was like a, a very uh, unexpected uh, situation like a war situation globally uh, and uh, the governments were uh, trying to secure food from different suppliers this became like the, the, the key thing uh, so at that point, uh, you know, the three main pillars of food security is nutrition, access, and safety of food. And these were kind of become more flexible and fluid in a way. Uh, and they, we have seen that the strategy of the governments and the private sector has changed uh, significantly. And since then, they're trying to directly uh, reach out to the suppliers and the producers as much as they can. Uh, rather than using the distributing the distributors or the traders in between, because in case of such a disruption, uh, they ended up with empty shelves. They ended up with uh, inputs that they have to use for their own production or supply of their uh, end product. Uh, so, and the governments also try to find ways of how they can access to different uh, suppliers, because the whole supply chain was based on efficiency uh, and cost. 
uh, which became the second uh, or third important uh, point during this process. Now it's all about having access uh, to the to the product product and how we can move it uh, to where you need it most. Uh, so this was, I think, the biggest uh, change in our work, and this affected our business model. This affected our solution. So we focused more on that front: how we can get the supplier on board much faster, uh, how we can make them more much faster compliant with the rules and regulations so they can, they can access to these markets and uh, there is no inefficiency in the system. Uh, so the, that waste also happened because in some, some countries, uh, they were not in, ready to respond to this request or demand from different parts of the world. Uh, so now they're trying to adapt to that. They are trying to be more agile. Thank you, Burak. So also, else? I can add on this. So yeah. with, with the COVID, first of all, um, for the all-inclusive hotels, I can say, um, due to the hygiene uh, issues, they had a, they had to adapt new approach in the serving lines, and that helped them uh, decrease waste dramatically. Um, so this is the first time the industry is uh, seeing by themselves actually they can decrease waste while keeping the customer satisfaction the same level. So this is a very key learning for the industry uh, for waste and saving potential perspectives as well. Also for the production lines of the factories, uh, food companies, uh, we see that they started um, the production plans on demand uh, and canceling uh, continuous productions at some specific lines that also cut uh, waste very dramatically. Uh, these were the very key points also for the retailers. Um, they, they were using like the old uh, big data to analyze the shrinkage ratios and uh, keep it at the minimum levels. But with the COVID, the data was broken and the trends of the consumers, so the household, household demand has changed. And a couple of times the out of uh, home <clears throat> food industry uh, opened and closed. Uh, so then this also uh, impacted the production lines and demand uh, demands. So uh, they the, the industry learned to be more agile on these changes. So this is a positive thing for future uh, demand planning and supply planning parts in, in the industry. But in the short term, of course, they, they, this case increased the waste. And this is one thing uh, I can say importantly. And the final thing I can say, uh, we see there's a trend in increasing wholesale uh, because of these uh, after the COVID issues, as Brock also mentioned some part of this, uh, but not only about the supply for the retailer shelves, etc., uh, but also because of the margins. Uh, now uh, companies are also focusing, trying, trying to increase their to uh, wholesale uh, parts. So these are the um, observations from my side. Thank you, Olje. Uh, I think uh, Abdul Rahman, you raise your hand. Uh, actually, for COVID, actually, it has impacted us very, very damaged for, for us because when COVID came, all coffee shops had a close, so there was not any kind of coffee waste exist. And actually, this was a problem because all the supplies that we have to start doing our operation at the stock. Uh, actually, we spent many. Actually, we, we, we take advantage of this time. We were rethink how we can uh, take advantage from, from, from this problem in the future, how we can do this, because we used to have that from coffee ground fresh from the coffee shops and start doing the operation right now, do the cultivation process. But after that happened, we found a way to be able to stall the coffee, uh, coffee ground. Now we have our own stock in case any crisis happen in the future, that we have our all the needed amount of coffee ground that can cover our production for six to eight months to be able to do our operation freely if there is any kind of coffee or coffee waste exists in the market. So uh, it affected us in the, in the beginning, but it was turned out that we had advantage out of it because we couldn't think that maybe one day we couldn't find any kind of coffee waste because we know coffee is very, very consumed beverage. So that was pushing us to think about this problem with a different way or with different perspective but it was affecting us in a way, actually. Thank you. David, I think- Yeah, you sure. Yeah, sure. So, um, you know, I'm an optimist and I always see opportunities. So when COVID started, 
I thought, okay, great. Now, you know, we're all going to wake up and we see that COVID is a crisis, but that the climate crisis that's going to be behind after it is going to be so much bigger. Um, I thought, you know, the world is going to change. Uh, it didn't really, of course. And now we're after, or we're, we're like in the final end of, of this uh, stage of COVID. But one thing really changed. And uh, or actually two things. One is consumer attitudes and consumers became a lot more aware. Uh, sustainability issues, especially in Europe, I, uh, I can't really say if that's the same in the, in the Middle East, uh, consumer attitudes really changed and people no longer accept uh, antiquated methods in, uh, along the food uh, system that are really wasteful. So people understand there's no time to waste. But then something else happened as well. That was more the, the, the war in the Ukraine uh, where uh, uh, that coincided with uh, reduced supplies uh, as well as, to, as uh, inflations. And suddenly uh, consumers really feel the pressure of uh, food in their wallet. And uh, suppliers, including supermarkets, can't just translate all of that into higher prices. So now suddenly there's a pressure on margins by retailers. Uh, and we were seeing that uh, a lot of retailers are really resorting to a lot more innovation. Uh, if they've, they've earned a lot of money during the, the COVID period and they're really ready to innovate. So I think we're in a, in a good stage now and we have to because uh, you know 2030, which is the, the Paris goals, uh, SDG, it's only seven years and seven months away. So uh, there's no time to waste. Thank you, David. Um, anyone else, uh, Ricardos or someone else who would like to comment on, on the impact of COVID? Um, on a global level, I don't have too much to add. Uh, maybe, maybe there was a lack of, uh, since COVID started, there was some restriction on investment for startups and, and degrees of valuation uh, in some cases. Uh, and a lot of companies allocated their money uh, to the COVID uh, um, risk management and those kind of stuff. But uh, on a regional level, I would like to add that um, in, in the country I live in, which is Lebanon, the, the crisis of the economical crisis was combined with COVID at the same time. So it was really, really hard for people to uh, live without working. So uh, the lockdown let them stay at home and uh, they were afraid to work uh, and the public sector couldn't afford um, the, uh, the monthly salary or uh, the insurance for the people that are in the lockdown so that it was like really hard on people and we are still in this crisis so yes COVID did really affect uh, countries like Lebanon that are still uh, in the development process uh, and in the change of politicals and also that are really uh, living the inflation uh, even before COVID. Thank you. I think, Burak, you, you would like to add something? Yeah, yeah I'd like to add something very briefly about uh, the, also, you know, David mentioned this, and uh, which is key. Uh, the, the public realized that the importance of local production and ex having access to local food was very important, uh, which was not the trend, which was not the case uh, previously, because, again, as a, a private uh, enterprise, the whole ecosystem was focusing on how we can increase the margins, how we can increase the profits. So they were producing the food in the most efficient way, but not close to the consumers. Uh, so this disruption during the COVID actually affected the policies of the governments and also the future plans of the private sector, how we can make it much more closer to the cons consumer, how we can increase local production and diversify the local production, not focus on uh, one or two uh, food items, but many food items so that they can, whenever there's a need, they can access to this easily. Uh, so th we will see more and more of these policies, uh, we, which already started, uh, and there has been some successful uh, cases like this in US. Uh, I think other countries are, are going to adapt this and they will try to uh, be as much as uh, possible in terms of self-sufficiency uh, of food production. 
Thank you. Um, please, um, all of you who are listening, do not hesitate uh, if you have any questions for our speakers to put them in the in the chat box. We just talked about um, challenges and opportunities, and, and David mentioned uh, innovation, uh, and, and Ricardo also mentioned uh, finance. Um, all of the, the companies, the, the five companies that we have today, uh, you're all, all your technology is very much reliant on um, AI uh, and on, on data and obviously on, on, on finance and R&D. Um, I was wondering, um, perhaps for uh, the, pe the people listening to us, could you elaborate on, um, you know, what are the, the, the challenges you're, you're facing? You know, is it, um, for instance, uh, Ricardo, you mentioned early on that uh, you were expanding uh, from apples to other products. Uh, so clearly there is an R&D uh, uh, dimension. Uh, what, what are in your own business uh, the, the biggest issues that you're facing to expand your business? Well, uh, maybe uh, the legislations uh, are one of the most important things that maybe uh, may restrict uh, a scaling of such a product to other countries. And, uh, you know, even if a product is certified organic or uh, it's certified, it's edible, and there, there's not too much effort on new technologies that has been done in different, in maybe all countries uh, that uh, allows uh, a, a direct entry and takes time and a lot of efforts and a lot of finance. Uh, also, um, if, if we want to talk about the collaborations uh, between public sector and, and private sector to uh, help such startups to uh, develop uh, and do the pilot trials on different uh, fruits, uh, it's all like, it, it's, it's been doing like, uh, for us, we are auto financing this. So there's no collaborations, no support uh, from public sector in our regions. And, and even in the US, it's hard to, to get the, the public support without like applying for a grant that takes like, uh, like most of your time in order to get the grant, which is in some cases not really effective. So um, uh, that's it. I think that's the most important thing to highlight. Thank you. David, Burak. I mean, uh, we, we talked, I think, uh, most of the uh, important things about the technology and, uh, and the finances. Uh, the technology that you're trying to use AI is uh, something still at the development stage, I would say, which requires a lot of data uh, itself uh, to learn from and to uh, make judgment or decisions that we can uh, use uh, to uh, make it better in our own system. Um, so the biggest challenge is accessing to a vast amount of data through a timeline through uh, which we don't have in a more structured way historically. So we're trying to structure the data which the machine can uh, make a decision based on that. So uh, which is not available at this stage, we're trying to still access, we're trying to gather this and we're trying to make it meaningful to make these decisions, uh, which will be the key. So we are, uh, not even halfway there. There's a, there's a long journey and uh, we're trying to fill the gap uh, in that sense. Well, we're, we're uh, Budak, we're an AI company as well. And actually what we did during COVID because we, had, uh, we didn't have enough data either. So we completely turned around our model. So we have, we have actually, uh, we've become very, very um, efficient about data. We've made a completely manual process. So actually now uh, in the past year, we've been get, getting so much data from a manual process where initially we wanted everything to be automated. So, so that might be an idea for you as well. I don't know, I haven't thought it through on, on your perspective yet, but don't get hung up on the fact that you don't have enough data. Try to turn it around and see where with less data you can actually get uh, get the engine rolling because that's what you need if you want to train your models. And, we, we have a, a machine learning, a reinforcement learning system, 
uh, which means we need a consumer in the loop. We need to be active. And that's actually what, uh, what really happened in, this, uh, in these past uh, 12 months. And uh, it's, it's exhilarating to see uh, the models work and, and really deliver results. I, I agree. I mean, there is uh, an incumbent uh, expertise in the system that's available, which you can utilize uh, and manually implement this uh, to your model. Uh, but to, to make it perfect, because we are trying to go to the micro level, uh, to uh, each and every region all around the world, so that we know each and every risk that might happen at a smaller scale, uh, then we can identify and alert all the players in the system uh, on a timely manner. Otherwise, it will be too late when the trade happened. So uh, we are trying to uh, perfect that. Uh, and we, that helps us, that expertise helps us uh, to address those. But still, uh, we are a bit behind what we're trying to be. Uh, that's, that's the thing. Uh, it's not stopping us uh, to do that, but uh, that is the process itself, I believe. Burak, your, your um, uh, company, QS Monitor, was one of the uh, four winners of the first uh, edition of uh, Food Tech uh, Challenge UAE. Um, it would be very uh, interesting for all of us, I think, to know about your experience. You know, how did it help uh, your, your business? Uh, well, I mean, it was, it was a great experience. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, it, it was a great experience. I mean, it was the first one. So obviously uh, now there are more stakeholders that are helping uh, the, the Food Tech Challenge to become successful. Uh, more companies uh, are involved. Uh, I'm sure the previous stakeholders learned from uh, the uh, first edition. Uh, we, we got a lot of help uh, from Catalyst, uh, the accelerator program uh, on many fronts uh, on making the company more uh, structured, organized, and uh, they helped us develop uh, certain systems as well, focus on our strategy going forward. Uh, and uh, we started working with the major players uh, in the region as well. So this helped us uh, grow the business in the region. Uh, of course, you know, the financial uh, support was very useful at that point. It came at a very uh, at right time uh, for us, uh, but also, you know, we moved to Abu Dhabi, which opened us a lot of other doors. We were based in Dubai initially. Uh, so we work with Abu Dhabi entities, all either the private or the public sector, very closely. Uh, they supported us all the way, uh, both the Food Tech Challenge team and the Catalyst team, uh, and other uh, stakeholders that are now uh, in the picture in the second edition. We mm -hmm. already uh, started our discussion on providing them some services. Uh, so I think this is this is a great opportunity to grow the business, to access to the right people, to, to the right stakeholders, and be part of this uh, whole uh, ecosystem in the region. Uh, and being here was a, as an advantage because our business model and our business was more uh, more or less focused around the, the needs of this region. Uh, so it helps us a lot. Uh, and uh, I think this is, this is a great program uh, in a nutshell, I would say. Thank you. I know, uh, David, that uh, Wasteless has already has always also been on, on many kind of competitions or won competitions and been on, on uh, some kind of accelerator program like uh, AgFunder, Food Bites. What is your experience uh, similar in terms of how it uh, helped uh, grow your business and access yeah. the right people and the right finance? Yeah, so I'm... Um... You know, at, at a certain stage in your in your uh, in your company, you need to to get on the stage, and you need to uh, to actually connect and uh, and bring your ideas to the world and and see uh, and spread the message. But then there's a there's a moment where actually spreading the message isn't enough anymore, and you actually want to become concrete. So um, so a program like uh, like like uh, like the one you're, you've, you're you're mentioning is extremely good because it actually turns all those words into action. We ourselves have been uh, uh, very successful, and uh, it it really made a big difference in the program uh, called EIT Food. Uh, uh, also, is is in there uh, in there as well. And actually, during the COVID period, we did a we did a big project with EIT. 
together with uh, with Metro, the German wholesale company. And uh, I dare say that it, it transformed the company. Even in the in the difficult times that we had, we couldn't travel, we couldn't actually meet the the C suites of uh, of retailers. But online, we uh, we actually did a full integration with Metro, which is uh, uh, opening up uh, 30 countries uh, for uh, for our solution. So these kind of programs are very beneficial if you're focused and if they're very much on your on your on the path that you've set out for yourselves but then uh, then really it can if you can make it work it's uh, it's it's uh, it's one of the the, the fastest ways to uh, to actually go to a, a proof of concept and uh, going to scale thank you david um we've talked a bit about uh, i mean quite a, a bit about consumer and the the role of uh, consumer sensitivity and uh, consumer education and consumer choice i mean this is clear for uh, your company, David, but for all, all the other companies. And we also have a, a, a question on uh, how from one of our participants, uh, Mohamed, how, how can we reduce uh, food waste? So I was wondering, and we also have a collection, all of you, uh, our speakers are uh, coming from different countries uh, in the region, and your companies are also expanding either in Europe or the US. So what how do you think we can help uh, consumers really become more aware uh, of the situation of food waste? Um, what are the, the best entry points to change attitudes? Uh, Ricardos? Yeah. So, um... To educate the consumer in a way that really takes him uh, to a level where he really can uh, ensure he's buying as much as he needs. That's first. So uh, man managing his own refrigerator, it's one like of the first steps. Second, educate the consumer on how to preserve his own fruit and how to use the uh, what is left from like, let's say he made a salad and uh, there's some cucumbers or other things uh, that he used in the salad left uh, on the side, how to use them in another recipe or how to preserve them in a way that he could use them in the next day. So um, that's, that's maybe the, 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 the simplest thing to, to uh, explain, but it's the hardest to do. Uh, which is the education, and it's a it's a behavior for whole community. So, if some uh, com uh, small groups of the whole community is doing this, it, it won't really uh, affect the whole chain. And on a on a retail level as well, um, what what has been doing uh, regarding uh, the 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 food that is near to to uh, to uh, expire and reducing their price in order to uh, to engage the consumer in, in reducing the food waste, buying those stuff is a really good thing to do as well. So uh, I think it's uh, more into education and uh, a whole lifestyle to take. Thank you. Abdul Rahman? For what you and the challenges with thinking about educating the customer actually is one of the major thing that we have done for our audience that our uh, our customer in Egypt for them people didn't know that we can recycle the spent coffee ground so sometimes people didn't know that there is something related to this kind of waste or food waste can be recycled so it's all about how we can educate them uh, when we started to do what we are doing in Kabmina our mission is how we can spend, uh, recycle the spent coffee ground and minimize the, the damage out of it but to be able to do this, we will our mainly focus will be on 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 commercial side, collecting spent coffee ground from coffee chains, uh, from big offices, from companies, but not collected from home because it requires a huge operation that we cannot afford at this time. So in this as this in this case, we start doing an awareness campaign on social media, helping people how to recycle spent coffee ground. We told them there is more than sixteen applications that you can use your own coffee ground that you made in your home. You can use it. You, for your uh, planet that you do it in your home 
you can do uh, skin care products, crafts for your body. There is many things that you can do, you can do is spend coffee ground. So I, I believe that uh, customer awareness or educating our customers, it's very important in stage to be able to spread the awareness for people to be able to know that there is something that you can do that this kind of waste can be recycled and we can do something for this. And it's, it's a matter of just let them know and they will start acting in this case to be able to uh, recycle this waste and minimize the amount of waste also if they can do this. Yeah. I uh, and I, I I said I was an optimist earlier, but uh, uh, and I, I and I really do believe in education. But uh, of course, I mean it's important to educate, but education isn't enough because people really need incentives. Uh, uh, we all, you know, people know that food waste in in in, in the Quran and in, in the food waste is considered uh, is considered uh, uh, very bad. In every religion, it's very bad. People know it, and no one does anything about it. The incentive, and then I'm talking from the waster's perspective, the incentive is uh, uh, financial. So people are just spending less on food that they have to consume slightly faster. And, uh, and that's really working. You know, in, in, if, if people give, uh, given the choice between a product with a longer expiration date and a product with a shorter, in uh, more than 40% people buy the shorter expiration dates because they pay less. So it's a combination, doing something that's good for the planet as well as for your wallet. And, uh, and I think actionable awareness is really where, uh, where the key is going to lie uh, if, we wanna, if we wanna get to, the, uh, to having food waste uh, in, uh, in seven years. Thank you, David. Uh, Burak, and I was just wondering whether we've lost uh, Oljay. I cannot see him anymore, but uh, if he's there, uh, but uh, Burak, please. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I'll just give a very quick tip to all the consumers and maybe the market. I mean, just uh, try to consume everything in season, uh, which was the case like a, a few decades ago. You know, when we were growing up, we didn't have access to all sorts of fruits and vegetables throughout the year. Now we have that access, but which is not the uh, best case for uh, the consumer, both from the nutrition perspective and also the efficiency in the market. Uh, but when you're consuming in season, it's more fresh, uh, so there's less waste. Uh, it is more nutritional uh, because that is when it's supposed to grow. And that means also it's closer to you. Uh, it was grown uh, closer to you. So I think uh, that is an easy tip uh, to achieve for the consumers if they're aware of this and not try to consume everything throughout the whole year. Uh, that will be much better for the whole uh, food ecosystem. Thank you. Um, is there any more uh, thoughts that any of you have on, uh, on consumer education or consumer incentive and how we can do better and also differences that um, you ha may have seen between different parts of the world and what works best where? Thing that the story one of friends that told me he has been in Germany and they ordered food from a restaurant. They ordered a lot of amount of food. They didn't eat it all of it. The, 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 the restaurant called police for them and made them pay money and punish for them for ordering more food than they need. And actually, this is, uh, the, we have to, to focus or see how the, the government is acting regarding to this. We are a startup business. Yes, we can act like this and we have adding uh, a value for minimizing the waste, but it's not enough. It has to be from uh, how other, other people or other organizations or uh, from the government itself acting uh, acting for this uh, uh, problem or for this issue of helping people to get uh, about uh, how to recycle or minimizing the waste itself and then learn them how to recycle it. Thank you so much. Uh, we're now almost uh, at the end of our time, so I just uh, wanted in closing to ask, uh, or maybe, uh, sorry, Ricardus, you wanted to add something? Your hands is yeah, up. Maybe if we have a bit of time. It's, a, it's, it's something funny. Uh, regarding the uh, most Arab countries and mainly uh, countries like Lebanon, so food waste is built in our culture somehow. It's built in. And how do I define this? It's 
it's generosity. Uh, so the people here thinks that if they serve more food on the table to a visitor to, or to their family, it means they are more generous. So um, if they have visitor and uh, they want to eat meat, so they buy like double or triple the amount they would eat. And this is the hard thing about it. It's a change of culture and change of the whole concept of generosity and food and uh, which is really hard. Like if I, if I keep talking about this for months with my family, for example, or uh, grandpa and grandmas, all people in, in the region, they really could not uh, understand what I'm talking about because they, they said, they would say like, if I change this, maybe all other people will think I'm not generous and they're not changing their, their, by themselves as well. So they have a fear of changing this. Uh, I don't know if this is solvable. Yeah, I think food is uh, so much connected to love and family and community and gener generosity, as you said, that it's really an issue that uh, we find uh, worldwide with many communities. Uh, but uh, being also an optimist like David, uh, and uh, I think you all testimony to it, uh, the generations are, are changing. Uh, and I think the awareness uh, is changing uh, at the same time. So my last question for all of you, um, uh, what would be the one piece of advice as an uh, ACTEC funder uh, you would give uh, to your younger self? as you embarked in, in this journey? Anyone who wants to start before I pass uh, back I, to uh, I, I would just say, you know, uh, not take this uh, for granted. Uh, the sector was kind of undervalued, uh, underestimated uh, by many people for many years. Uh, it's taken for granted. I think everybody has to, uh, take this seriously uh, at a personal level as well and try to learn as much as they can. I mean, there are very interesting stories of uh, the food technologies, the evolution of food and how it affects our life, how it affects our health and environment. Uh, I think having a significant awareness on this at a personal level is key. How we can teach our kids uh, the importance of this and uh, what they should know about their environment uh, and their, their relation with the environment, their relation with what they consume as well, and how it affects us, how it affects the next generations is, I think, very important. So I would say, uh, growing up, I would be much more interested uh, in these topics rather than other things, and uh, I would read more uh, and uh, talk more on this on these issues. Thank you. David, Abdulhamid. Yeah, yeah. David. We, you know, we were, we were, we were early to the to the market in the sense that you know we've been doing this for four years and uh, food waste was really not on the agenda. So one lesson to myself is uh, to my younger self would be even if you're early, uh, use the time to learn and and do persist. Uh, if you're early, uh, you don't, you shouldn't lose confidence. You should, uh, but you should also keep on improving and challenging yourself. I think that's a, that's a, that's a, that's a very important one. And the second lesson is that we started out by by positioning food waste prevention as a sustainability issue, and um, uh, and very early on, I, we went to the states to a to a big conference in New York uh, uh, called NRF. We started talking to uh, retailers and I understood at the third conversation, we should be talking about green, but mm. not about sustainability green. We should be talking about dollar green because mm. that's what they are interested in. So, and this is like uh, three and a half year, three years ago, and it really changed the dynamics. So if you have a profitable case, even though your, your inherent, your own motivation is sustainability, Try to see it from the perspective of your customer and your customer. Sustainability is a nice to have. You got to find and tap into his need to have, and that's scalability, profitability. So uh, that that's that's a good lesson, I think, that I would have liked a couple of years earlier. Yeah, and I think you're 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 right. It's something that I've seen also uh, personally in in many different sectors, and it's not just uh, for the customers; it's also for the investors. 
profit and sustainability, both of them uh, go well together. Um, uh, just, just one thing. I, I always quote, and I sorry, should do it today as well. Uh, Project Drawdown. If someone doesn't know it, Drawdown.org. It uh, is a meta study, very scientific. Looks at the most impactful ways to to reduce carbon emissions, and the most impactful and profitable solution is food waste prevention. So all of you keep on using Drawdown. It's extremely good research. And it really helps you drive the message to uh, to your uh, to your markets and to uh, to consumers. So uh, drawdown.org. Thank, Thank you, David. Abdul Rahman, one last word to conclude. Uh, when you started okay? Carmina, we, we did a lot of mistakes, like having a start of you or studying and interacting and just exploring the, the, the things around us. I would uh, advise myself to be easy in yourself. It's okay to make mistakes. You learn from mistakes, so you keep working and you keep going. And that's what we are doing in the life. Thank you. And Ricardo's? Yeah, one thing to mention uh, for entrepreneurs in this field is that we are dealing with uh, one of the most active and sensitive sector. Uh, we're dealing with living objects. So, uh, anything regarding food is something that needs a lot of solutions, and in some kind, in some in in some uh, portfolio of products, you don't need to be perfect to go to the market. So, without reaching perfection, uh, perfection of your product, you can go to the market and that, get a lot of feedback from it. So, you can lead the development in a way that suits with the customer and the market, especially when we're targeting. A, a really good strat, uh, pricing strategy and marketing strategy. So a lot of uh, entrepreneurs takes a lot of time to to uh, launch their product or launch their service, and at the end they they fall because they made it their way, not the way consumer wants or the market needs. Um, so that's it from my part. Thank you. Thank you so much to the four of you. And uh, thank you also to Olj, uh, who is no longer there with, with us at the end. Uh, and it was, it was very inspiring. And I pass on the floor back to Max. Thank you. Thank you, Anne. Uh, thank you, everyone, again, for joining. Uh, just before, just to close down on, on the topic of food waste, I just wanted to answer to a question from uh, Mohana in the chat, who was asking like where food waste is coming from. Um, so it's such a very broad question. As a matter of fact, I think like 70% of food waste, you know, if we look at it at, at a global scale, is actually happening before reaching the consumers or before reaching the retailers or the restaurants or, or the consumers' homes. Uh, the problem is that that percentage varies depending on where, where you're talking about, uh, from one continent, from one country to the other. The, it's the same issue that has different sources. Uh, different reasons, different solutions. Uh, when you talk about sources, that could be cultural, and that's something that is being mentioned in the chat many times, but it's also logistics issues, um, climate issues, uh, and many other sources, which is why uh, in, in that session today, we're trying to bring different perspectives and different solutions. And I think it is not uh, a one size fits all uh, kind of like solution. We need to look at it in a, in a holistic view as much as possible. Um, again, thank you everyone for joining tonight. Uh, and uh, if you haven't applied yet, if you consider applying for the Food Tech Challenge, uh, here you can find uh, the link to do so. And should you have any questions about forward fooding or the Food Tech Challenge, uh, you can reach out here on our websites or uh, email addresses. And uh, we look forward to see everyone in the next uh, in the next webinar. Thank you for joining. Thank you. Thank you, Anne. Thank you. Bye bye.